Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. And thanks for spending a bit of time with us. We are certainly living in some interesting times, no matter where you are in the globe. And we're gonna spend the next hour sharing our global perspective. As you can tell, you've got a group of panelists here who come from different parts of the world with different parts of experiences. But the one thing we all have in common is how do we help each other through this period of time? Um, as you go through the agenda, you'll see we have a myriad of topics we're gonna to talk about around leadership, coaching, teaching. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about what are the practical things we can do now. We'll also spend some time talking about how do we recover through this? And what are some of the things we can start planning and thinking about? Throughout this entire session, this is intended to be interactive. So please submit your questions through the Q&A feature, which is in the center of your Zoom uh, screen experience. Or feel free to use the chat box if you'd like to ask a question to your fellow sales leaders that are on the phone as well. So it's not just intended for us to respond, but you can use the power of the peer network to gather responses to your questions. So with that, if you can go to the next slide, please, Jens. Thanks again. So let's take a, a moment to meet our panelists for today. I'll ask Julie to introduce herself first, followed by Peter and then Jens. So Julie, I'll pass it over to you. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon for those of you in uh, Europe and elsewhere. Uh, my name is Julie Thomas. I'm the president of Value Selling Associates, and I am thrilled to be with you today. Thank you. Peter? This is Peter Sondergaard. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I am um, an advisor uh, to several organizations now in, in a variety of different industries, uh, both software, hardware, uh, healthcare, and financial services. And prior to this, I was the uh, head of research globally for Gartner. Um, and I look forward to this session with all of you. Fantastic, Peter. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jenslin Winder, and I'm uh, I've <laughs> really feel in safe hands at the moment because back in 2007, I basically exactly uh, 13 years ago, I started working for Gartner, and uh, Peter was leading Gartner through the financial crisis. Peter was mentioning at the uh, Gartner Symposium in 2007 that CIOs should have two IT budgets uh, going into 2008 and 2009 and seeing the impact for the people who followed that advice was, was great. So back in 2015, I joined Value Selling Associates. I was actually trained at Value Selling uh, Framework uh, while I worked for Gartner. Uh, and I had the opportunity to, to join the team at Value Selling back in 2015. So having been able to see what Julie has been doing with this organization, just for <laughs> the way that she has changed the business uh, through uptimes, that has been amazing. So I feel that we are in safe hands at the moment uh, with the, especially you two guys on the table. So uh, it was not an, so much of an introduction for myself, but uh, thank you for being here and I'm looking forward to participate. I'm based out of Copenhagen in Denmark. Uh, and what about you, Tony? What are, who are you and what are you doing? Who am I is a deep question we're not going to answer on this call, <laughs> to be honest with you, Jens. I'm Tony Castillo, Managing Partner for Valley Selling Associates, and I work predominantly with uh, organizations across North America. So it's great to be here today, everyone. And um, let's get things started. If you can uh, advance the slide, Jens, that would be great. So it's clearly not business as usual, right? It's an obvious statement, but one that really resonates as the month of March comes to an end and we kick off our first full month in this new normal environment that we find ourselves within. Julie, I'm gonna start off with you if you don't mind. Um, what types of conversations are you having these days with sales and business executives? What seems to be top of mind with these folks? Well, I think um, a couple of things. A couple common themes are uh, popping out as we talk to sales leaders. Number one, uh, many organizations are wrestling with managing remote sales reps where they've never had to do that before. So we've been talking to a lot of reps about that, but we've, or sales leaders about that, but we've also been talking to sales leaders about how they can position themselves 
um, to sell through this crisis. And, you know, every company is different because who they sell to is different. But for m many of our clients, business hasn't completely stopped. So they are having to lead their sales reps and, and sometimes convince them that uh, people are still buying in this world, depending on who, who you are, are calling on. Not to say that things haven't changed in certain segments of the market and in certain verticals in the market, but people are still buying. Uh, there was an article in Barron's last weekend that I read that talked about all of the companies, and there were quite a few that are at their 52-week high in the stock market, um, even through this crisis and even through this, this turmoil. So one of the things that we're finding um, in, in terms of sales rep, sales leaders thinking about is the whole idea of coaching and coaching remotely. And what they're finding is if they had a team that was undisciplined before this crisis, and they had sales process that was undisciplined before this sales process, they have a steeper hill to climb than organizations that had some discipline and rigor around their, their processes and had coaching installed. But for regardless, all those leaders are, are having to focus on creating time, allocating time to do that one-on-one -on -one individual development with their teams and now they have to do it remotely so maybe they're turning on a zoom camera like we mm -hmm. have here um, but those are some of the things that we're talking to them about they also realize that coaching is not it's not a quick fix you have to invest in coaching over time it's not a one and done i had my one-on-one -on -one with you i gave you some coaching and now everything is going to change Coaching is a process that happens over time and requires, um, requires iterations in terms of uh, how you're going to ultimately get the, the maximum return on that. But what we do know is teams that have strong coaching cultures outperform those that don't. Okay. That's great, Julie. Thanks for sharing that observation. And... Um... I know that recently uh, value selling with the training Institute did a survey of over 300 people in, in the learning profession. And you guys were basically observing best practices with coaching and teaching. So it's very timely, this research note, um, in the interest of time, could you just briefly share one or two observations or best practices that surfaced out of that research? I'm just curious what we could share with the group this morning or this yeah. afternoon. First and foremost, uh, companies that report that they have a coaching program in place also report higher than average business results in their sector or in their segment. So coaching does make a difference. Developing the people on your teams makes a difference. And we kind of differentiate. Coaching is all about developing people, where managing is about getting the results. And as sales managers and leaders, we wear both hats. We have to deliver the results. Today's March 31st. Many of us have to deliver uh, the goals and objectives of our organizations today in terms of revenue contribution. That said, um, coaching isn't that quick fix. So the other thing that we found is companies that look at coaching initiatives as a long-term investment in, the, in their people do better than companies that look at it as a flash in a pan. This month, this quarter, we're going to coach. And so we're going to train everybody yeah. on coaching. And this quarter, we're going to coach. And then next quarter, we're going to do something else. Coaching is a long-term um, investment in for what most of us is our most valuable asset, and that is our human capital. So looking at that and developing the coaches. The other thing that we found out is even a coach needs a coach, and we need to look at as a systemic organizational process, not just the first line gets all the coaching and everybody else is is the wild wild west and a cowboy mm -hmm. it's really a culture where everybody gets coached everybody has a coach and they develop that trust within the organization that it is about developing us as individuals thanks julie that's great and i couldn't agree more i think this i love your concept of every coach needs a coach especially in today's 
reality. We all need the openness to teaching and coaching one another, but also leaning on each other. And I, I don't think that's more real than ever um, in, in the history for sales professionals as we are living through this right now. Yeah, and so I'm just curious, can we just check the Q&A box? Let's see if there's any questions for Julie that have come up so far. Yeah, let's see here. Um, we have one. So Julie, you're talking a lot about coaching, but uh, you have, and, and you also talk about the balance between the management, uh, managing, how do you get time to do the prioritization of coaching? Uh, how do you get time? Isn't it? That's always the, 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 the $50,000 question, right? How do I put something else on my plate? Well, I think it is a, for, it starts with a recognition of what is our role. And if we buy into the concept that our role is to both de develop the people and deliver the results, then we can start to allocate our time toward those two objectives. So when, when people tell me they don't have enough time to do something else, I usually ask them, let's, okay, let's get into your priorities or let's look at what's on your plate. Can something be delegated or are you doing something that somebody else should be doing in your organization? So once you look at the priorities and look at what's on your plate, then it's a matter of time management and calendar, calendar management. And I believe the more proactive we are at our calendar management, the better we are. So time blocking is huge for me. Am I scheduling the time for the one-on-one -on -one calls to coach and are those calls non-negotiable and today in today's virtual work at home reality which at least in the US it looks like this is going to continue for at least the next 30 days that means I have to be uh, scheduling time with you because I'm not going to catch you anymore at the water cooler or in the hallway or you're not going to be able to pop into my office and say hey can we talk about this and let's look at this so so the reality is we have to manage that and we have to um, not only focus on what we're going to do as a coach but set up the people that are being coached to be most effective and productive in those meetings as well Great feedback. Thanks, Julie, for sharing and I appreciate the, the commentary. So guys, feel free to continue to pop in uh, questions in the question and answer box or the chat and we'll get to everyone's questions at the end of the session as well. As well, we'll try to ask some questions throughout the rest of the session. So let, let's switch over to Peter now, if you don't mind advancing the slide, Jens. Um, Peter, this new normal, right? This has now become the way we are coexisting in the world. Um, and thanks again for joining us today, Peter. Uh, I know one of your true passions is observing leadership, but more importantly, how successful leaders actually go about leading in periods of turmoil or crisis. Um, and I don't like using that word crisis loosely, but it kind of feels like, you know, we might be in a crisis mode at some point. Um, what are you seeing across the executive leadership teams that you're engaging with these days? What, what's been sort of the general theme or commentary from folks? Uh, I mean, the first thing to uh, keep in mind for all of us is that um, leadership matters. Uh, and, and by saying leadership matters, this is actually financially and, and, and uh, monetarily proven that strong leadership teams actually have a very substantial impact on the performance of an organization over a sustained period of time. And yes, this is a crisis situation. It's not the only crisis situation that companies will uh, uh, see, but it is a crisis situation. And in situations like that, um, there are different muscles, uh, leadership skill muscles that we need to flex. Uh, sometimes we haven't had a chance to flex though. And it's kind of been my observation that, um, you know, there are probably about 10 of them and we'll get to them in the next slide, but there are about 10 of them that in my mind are, are really important uh, for us to, to understand. Now, when you scan these, um, think of great leaders that you know. We can pull out great leaders from history. Winston Churchill, situation of crisis. 
um, Mahatma Gandhi situation of crisis. Uh, and you will very likely see that these 10 leadership skills were displayed, not all the time, but over a sequence of time uh, by these leaders. And today you will find um, the leaders across many organizations using these. I'm not gonna go through each of them, but I do wanna just point out that there are skills that are really about uh, the emotional IQ uh, of a leader. This is about showing compassion, truthfulness, empathy, being clear. And then there's also the very hard leadership skills, the ones that distinguish us in terms of being able to execute, demonstrating agility, uh, understanding cost management, and it is my view that these 10 skills are the most important ones right now. Um, now, you may also scan this list and say, that clearly describes me. And, and ultimately, <laughs> I may then be a great leader. And I think that is perfect. Uh, and it is very likely that all of you on this call do this some of the time. What we need to get to is all of us need to do these all of the time. And if we do them, then we have a responsibility moving back to what Julie said is then we have to become the coaches and the mentors of others because the strength of an organization in terms of its performance, whether it is leaders across the sales organization or leaders more broadly comes from the fact that everybody displays these skills. That is what develops the power of an organization to execute through the next, uh, next number of, uh, of months, if not probably the next six months. So you can yourself be better at these. And if you are good at them, become a teacher and a mentor. That's great. Um, insight, Peter. Peter, I'm curious, um, not to put you on the spot, but how would you recommend to a leader checking the pulse on the progress that they're making in this or just doing a little bit of validation that they're actually, you know, doing this in an effective way? Because the point you made, which I thought resonated with me is we all think we're great leaders. You actually got a smirk out of me on that because of course, I'm a great leader, right? But, but what have you seen work effectively to kind of check that pulse and check your own ego at the door sometimes? Because th I think that's the other challenge we have sometimes. So I'd, I'd love to get some perspective from you on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the first thing is think about when you did this last. If, if you go, oh, yeah, I did this last Wednesday. And so I'm good. I've checked the box. Then you're fooling yourself. Uh, Julie mentioned communication as being really important here. Uh, keep in mind that you may think you're communicating excellently by telling people once. Assume that only 20% of the people understood some of what you said the first time you communicated it. And so repetition is important in this. Doing this mm -hmm. continuously is important. And, and again, that was Julie's message in terms of coaching on, um, on, on sales skills. It, it is repetition. Coaching is about repetition. And it is about, therefore, thinking not I did this check, but I am doing this continuously and continuously questioning whether or not I can't get a little better. That's great. I love that, Peter. And I would assume you overlay that with a bit of compassion, a little bit of care, a little bit of gratitude, and, and you've got the EQ and IQ balance that you need. Absolutely. Love it. Hey, Jens, um, just curious, do we have any questions that have come in yet for Peter? I'd love for him to take a question before we move on. Yeah, we have one. And that's say, so Peter, when do you think that leaders, leaders will need to start focusing on... Uh, just a minute. On the efforts on bouncing back, when do they need to focus on bouncing back from the crisis that we're in at the moment? Now. Uh, now. And, uh, and, and we'll talk about that a little later. 
Uh, so it's a great setup. Um, I'm not going to go into more depth than just basically saying we should start doing that now. When you're in the middle of something is when you also start to look at how do you move further. Uh, and so I think we need to do that now. We'll get back to that. Yeah. There's another question coming in here. If you as a leader and you're having a little time, then you want to focus on the most impactful, impactful critical leadership, which one would that be? If you should choose one critical leadership skill, what would that be? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's always the, qu the question is, is like, is there one thing that gets me through things? So, so you're trying to try to jump over the fence where the fence is lowest. Um, but, but let me indulge you, uh, is I, I think right now communication and over communication at different levels in the organization is really important. Uh, and if you do that, demonstrating empathy, truthfulness, and clarity, you've kind of ticked off four of them, if that's what you're looking for. The second thing is prioritization and execution. It is you have to ruthfully, ruthlessly, sorry, prioritize and make sure you execute. So uh, communication and prioritization with execution is really where you can tick off a lot of these. Um, but there isn't just one that will get you through this and, and you can sort of push the others to the side. That's interesting. All right, Jens, let's move on to the next. Yeah. Tony, we turn into uh, to your perspective. So what can sales leaders do to support their teams in a situation that they are in right now? Yeah, so I think we've got some great comments from Julie and Peter about our executive leaders and our senior leaders. And, and I wanna take that now and I wanna just bring that down to a sort of tactical, practical level, right? So what are some of the things we can do right now to support our teams? The first one seems like an obvious one, but it is actually a time to think about setting those clear expectations. And what we mean by that is you probably need to revisit, rewrite and recast what those top priorities are. To Peter's point, um, what are the top priorities in the next 30, 60, 90 days? We all have great intentions. Everyone intends to do great work, to stay focused, but in this new virtual world that we're in, there's distractions, there's a lot of things going on, there's a lot of noise that surrounds us. So we have to make adjustments and, and do those in a way that's very purposeful. So it's time for us to set clear expectations on what does good look like over the next 30, 60, 90 days. And if we do that, we create a singular sense of purpose. We all come around and come together on this singular sense of purpose. And purpose drives mission and vision and execution. So I think that's really important. Um, the next thing is, look, we've enabled remote productivity, whether we like it or not, we're all in a remote world now. That doesn't mean everyone at home is entirely productive. I don't know about you guys, but my first couple of days working from home, I had four kids, a barking dog, and a lot of things going around that really made it hard to stay focused, right? So if you've got your people working from home now, just do a quick sanity check. Do they have the proper headset? Do they have a mic? Do they have the right technology in place? Do they have noise canceling software in the background so you don't hear kids and dogs barking? I learned that the hard way the first couple of days, as I said. Um, do they have a full size monitor at home? Do they have the ergonomics set up in their home office to be comfortable? Give them some support and guidance to make that experience as comfortable as is possible because they're gonna be working from home, prospecting, closing deals, for the foreseeable future. So that environment, you can help create that environment. Um, one of the organizations I work with has actually sent um, self-care kits to all of their reps. So everyone last week got delivered a self-care kit that had some toys, some snacks, some water bottles, just some little things to let people know, hey, your remote productivity is really important. Fostering resilience, I think, is really important. And that means as leaders, we actually have to get directly engaged in our meetings. 
make those tough calls with our clients and our prospects, whether it's retention or growth. Pick up the phone, lead by example. Pick up the phone, do some prospecting, do some discovery meetings, set up some demos for three to six months down the road. Do the things that you know need to get done, but lead by example with your team. And debrief constantly, right? In this new reality that we're in, it's so important that you get real time debrief and information so that you can adapt. And this is what's referred to as situational leadership, right? You help your team identify a problem, you analyze that problem, you solve it, and then you empower them to execute. And you reward them for the effort, not the outcome, but the actual effort, because it's hard to build up the inertia to go do this sometimes. And then lastly, to Peter's point, um, daily behavior matters. And Julie made this point as well. So one of the things I've recommended to people is look, your behavior, who you are is really important. It's not what you say, but it's what you do during these times. So what are you doing to lead by example, to Peter's point and Julia's point? How are you demonstrating through your daily behaviors what good looks like? And what does that really mean in terms of actions, steps, and tasks? And then make sure that the, the balance of your leadership team is also on that same page. Sales is still at the hub here. So we need everyone to still be fixated on helping sales, enabling sales. And then lastly, I would say is recognize the behaviors of your team. When you see people going outside their comfort zone to do something, maybe your BDRs and SDRs have only ever done inbound and now you're asking them to do outbound. Acknowledge that that's hard. Show them that you get it and that they're really making an effort. So recognize the daily behaviors and trust in the relationships because trust and relationships surpass position. At this point, your position and title doesn't matter that much. It's how you're building trust and fostering relationships, both with your clients and with your team. Um, with that, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Joni. Well, I think uh, talking about getting out of the comfort zone and so on, it turns uh, give a, a great segue for me to go in, into discussion on what are we doing when the going gets tough? And I think that all of you come with great advices when I put looking at my notes at the moment. I think that even though if you're looking as Julie into the uh, sales leadership part of it on the sales coaching, the virtual communication, uh, that has a lot of skills around that. Peter is going into a conversation on leadership as a discipline where Peter, maybe you've been more in the uh, running the company rather than running the sales organization. You actually see a lot of more both in the HR and the IT and uh, all kinds of other parts of the organization. Uh, but the leadership discipline that you're talking about here and what uh, Tony is talking about in the sales operations part is pretty much the same. I think that the, the two words I can put together is that execution and working remote and finding out how to, to do things now is something that's really important. Um, what I'm looking at is that we the call. I was looking into some data. We have an exclusive par exclusive partnership with a company called Objective Management uh, Objective Management Group, who's a pioneer in the uh, Salesforce evaluations, and they've tested more than 1.9 million salespeople over the last 30 years. So we have a great base of benchmarks here. And the Objective Management Group categorized uh, 21 sales competencies where they look at uh, <laughs> what does a salesperson look like. Uh, what is the competences that they have? So I looked into the data and said, well, based on the insights we have here, what are the skills that will set out if you will be a top performer and where will you struggle more? And one finding was that when I looked across the top 10 performers, the average salespeople and the bottom 10% performers, uh, I looked at the coachability score and that was exactly the same. So everybody has the same amount of uh, skills, no matter if you're the top performer or the bottom performer, you will statistically have the same level in coachability. But where you have one of the main differences was in the responsibility part of it. Um, and Julie was talking about the, the fact that people are making excuses on that the customer is not buying at the moment. Uh, and Peter said, well, <laughs> it's now you have to execute. Uh, what we look at when we look at the responsibility score is if people are 
taking responsibility or if they're making excuses. And when we look at the three main areas you can make excuses, it is within, uh, you blame the customers for not having the budget. You blame the customers for not being able to make a decision. You may also make uh, excuses and blame the competitors or the market that, uh, well, we're in a situation where the customers has cut the, uh, the project. So the competitors are cutting the prices to get in. They are cutting the prices to survive. And the third part is that you're blaming the company for the internal processes where you make excuses because you're not allowed to drop the prices just as much as the competitors. And because of that, you're not able to win business. And if you blame either one, if, if either if you blame the customers, if you blame the market or the competitors, if you blame companies' internal proce uh, processes or policies, you're not learning anything and you're not being creative to find ways to solve something. And unfortunately, we can see in the uptimes that we have been through for the last 10 years, uh, the data shows that the average salesperson has a tendency to make more excuses rather than taking responsibility. And if you look at the bottom 10% of the salespeople, they are just a little bit lower, but actually not a lot lower than the average salesperson. But the top 10% sales performers, they are taking responsibility to find a way to get into the situation where they will be able to win business, no matter if they're beaten up with the some guy who is coming to tackle them from a competitor, whatever it is, they will find a way to solve it and, and make the score. Uh, I think that relates a lot to what uh, both Peter and Tony and Julie talked about on uh, on finding a way to, uh, to execute. Um, another area is commitment. We're looking at five areas in uh, the competency called will to sell, where we say, well, the commitment will be looking at uh, how much do you want to do to make this happen? How much are you willing to sacrifice yourself uh, to make the numbers that you want to make? Uh, are you are going for it? I think the best way that I can describe it is to compare it if you are a runner and you want to run a marathon, then you set the bar high if you want to run the marathon fast. Uh, and if you just want to run a five kilometer race with the low, uh, low speed, well, then you are more exercising. And the person who has the desire to run the marathon fast uh, and will be able to tie the shoelaces even uh, when the uh, wind is tough and you have the hail in the face, that's the person who has a high commitment. Uh, and the same thing goes for the, um, for the salespeople. Uh, you will see salespeople who are committed. They will do whatever it takes. They will pick up the phone, do the tough calls. And I think that will be some of the areas that we have to look into at the moment uh, where we will have to guide the salespeople to, to do that. Um, and then the final one we have is the sales process. So if we have to be able to support our people with the, with the support our salespeople, with some guidance on how to drive the process. We have to do it virtually. We have to be on the phone. We have to have a common process. We have to be in agreement on what is it actually that we want to achieve. And we have to have a common language on how to move from where we are to where we want to go to be able to, uh, to close the deal. Then we have to be very specific on how to drive the sales process. And we can see basically that the top 10 performers are strong in both the sales process. They're strong in the commitment and are strong in the responsibility. And we have to help the uh, uh, the rest of the sales team to build up some of the sales competencies and uh, and drive the um, uh, the process and, and and do whatever it takes to make the deals and, and win some business. Uh, so I think with the with that I think we have some of the insights and and some of the challenges that we will be facing when we have to look at who will be the ones who will succeed going through the situation we are in right now and who will, with the maybe not so flattering words, say who will be sitting on their hands and wait for the crisis to be over. So who will win in, in this battle we're going into? Tony? Thanks, Jens, I appreciate the overview. So. 
So we've talked a little bit about current state, a little bit about, quote unquote, the crisis that we're in, regardless of how we define crisis. And, and Peter, I know I skirt around that word and the use of that word, but you're right, we are in a crisis, right? And the, the quicker we acknowledge that, the quicker we can react and respond to it, which I think is a nice segue to talking about how do we look to recover and what are some of the things and actions and thinking, because for a lot of us, we have time on our hands to actually think and plan about our recovery versus just spending endless days on Zoom conference calls back to back. So I'd love to get some of this optimism fueled uh, as we you know, look to wrap up the content portion of our webinar before we go into question and answer. So Peter, let, let me ask you, what are you thinking and seeing and observing when it comes time to plotting out the recovery? Yeah, so this obviously is a gigantuan question, right? Because uh, th this is a, a, about the entire organization now moving forward. Now, first, great leaders obviously are the ones that not only think about the current situation, but also think ahead. Uh, and that is really about thinking, how am I going to get through the recovery phase? Because that's actually going to be equally as complex as the phase that we're in right now. So we're, we have to think of this as multiple phases. And the next phase is recovery, followed then by a new normal growth phase. Now, recovery is really about the execution of the recovery. That, that is why uh, I call this really something that is about recovery execution. Um, and how can you look at this, uh, comparing it to something that you may be familiar with? This is in essence not any different than the strategy planning process of an organization that we go through every year. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also has the same characteristics of strategy planning, namely that it is relatively easy to come up with ideas for strategy. 85% of companies fail in the execution of the strategy. And so focusing on how we execute is, is the important aspect. And so you need a framework. So if you go to the next page, I started kind of putting my personal view of what could be this recovery execution framework. Now, first you can look at this in so many different dimensions. I chose to look at it as the function or the role and what responsibility that function and role has in the organization that may be only for the function, but may likely also be a shared responsibility for the organization as a whole. And that's really how you need to look at this. And then secondly, look at it in terms of which things can I do that have immediate impact and which things have a slightly longer impact and when you look at the slide and you move from your screen left to right, that's longer out to the right. And obviously, uh, in the beginning are some of the things that are things you should be doing now as recovery management. But I think the most important thing is really the successful companies are the ones that think structured in the execution because they know that it is in the execution that we fail. And then very likely thinking a little bit about what is then the stage after the execution. And in my mind, it is very clear. We have been for the last 10 years talking about digital transformation. The next mm -hmm. stage is about digital acceleration because we are a gigantic pilot for why digital works. It shows in what is now the definition of the digital workplace. It shows in terms of selling and the different channels that works. It shows in terms of what we're doing in digital marketing. It shows in terms of how we execute with suppliers in our supply chain. All of it are using digital and in this sense, the uh, explosion of data to present and create a better organization and therefore take dust off those potentially somewhat failed digital transformation projects and make them 
what defines your organization going forward after you really become a black belt in recovery execution. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great point, Peter. I don't know if you've seen, um, there's, this, there's this Twitter that's going around, right? That's being tweeted all over the world. And it talks about digital projects, Peter, and it says percentage by CEO endorsed, percentage yeah. by CIO endorsed, percentage by crisis COVID-19 endorsed. Yes. And it's amazing to see, to your point, how many of these projects that had good intentions and good charters have all of a sudden gone into execution mode, but had been in a planning phase of perpetuity, right? It's just never ending planning. So I think that's, that's really interesting. Peter, when I look at your recovery execution, I wonder to myself, how much do you do in your functional area as a group and team versus the integrated cross business unit? Do you have a perspective? Like, are you seeing silos being busted because of this? Or is there still some challenges to kind of overcome? And do you have any guidance around that? Uh, I'm seeing people being more open to not operating in a siloed mode, but I, I, we are going to see siloed mode even through this. Uh, I, I think, and, I, and that's why I come back to, do we have an example? And I think that the way companies and great companies do strategy execution, uh, that is in fact uh, how we need to apply the same thinking here in terms of how do we do recovery execution. The two things are exactly the same. Uh, and, and I therefore believe that companies that do an excellent job in terms of strategy demonstrate a non-siloed approach to strategy. Uh, they don't think about the success of the function. They think about how the function contributes to the success of the organization. And so your colleagues uh, that you work primarily with is not the people that report to you. It's the people that are your peers. And that's always been my philosophy is don't think about the primary people as necessarily the ones that work for you. You're the primary people for success going forward now are your peers. 